This is not your mother's middle age. No longer is waking up each day, living the wash, rinse, and repeat cycle acceptable. We have the life lessons, the relationships, the wins, and the losses with which to navigate to our highest self without hesitation and without fear leading the way. We have been there and done that, and so we have so much to offer the world and each other. So join me on this journey speaking to ordinary women doing extraordinary things for new insights, new ideas, new medical breakthroughs, and new life lessons. You will be inspired to find your best life here and now. My name is Wendy Charles McGuire, and this is your Second Wind Podcast. Today, I'm sitting with George Dillard of the Peachtree City Christian Church. Yeah. PTC3 is how you find it. And I met George randomly because the minister we had lined up to marry my daughter last May had COVID. Yeah. And I reached out to friends saying, I don't go to church. What am I going to (laughs) do? And a friend of mine is a friend of yours and works here in the church and said, oh, let me call George. And as it turned out, I didn't even think of it, but your wife, Renee, yeah. had already been on the podcast and talked about how she was helping when COVID started right, yeah. with the laundry baskets, baskets and bringing of lots of food yeah. and snacks and offering support. And then some of the struggles she's had um, in your family and all these things and, and how she stays positive as, as the wife of the guy. <laughs> Man. The wife of the guy. Of, of a guy. Of a guy yeah. that does the stuff. Right. So I, since, and working with you and my daughter and my now son-in-law, loved your presence, loved what you said, and I said, oh, I guess I should start going to church <laughs> <laughs> because I could relate. And so I, I come when I can, but if I can't come because of work, I listen and watch on Live, yeah. On the live, the YouTube thing, yeah. and it works but, out yeah. great. And I get the I get the lessons, and I I go to work kind of feeling better about everything. And how will I apply it? But my my goal with Second Wind, one of the reasons I started this podcast, was to find out and answer questions of life: why, the why, the how, why is why are we here? And a lot of people feel that way. And one of the yeah. big questions I asked you when we were talking was like. Well, how do you know? And <laughs> how, how, why do you believe? And have you always believed? Yeah. So, because I really want to believe, and I want to go there. But the I, reason I'm laughing. Uh, yeah, you're Wendy, laughing. Well, the reason I'm <laughs> laughing is because one of the things I tell people all the time is knowing why does not always make it better. Mm. See, we, we think it does. You know, we always want to know why. Why, yeah, why, why? True. But I tell people, so what if God spoke to you and, and you said, God, why did you do this? And he said, well, because you're so stupid, you wouldn't have got it any other way. That was the only way you're going to get it. That wouldn't ne- necessarily make you feel better. Correct. Okay. <laughs> you know, that the maker of heaven and earth thinks you're dumb. Uh, but, you know, uh, no, but seriously, uh, you know, I, I just really truly believe that knowing why is not always better because we, the, everything is so connected mm. that it's impossible really to pin down a single thing as to why. I, I learned this years and years ago when I was standing at the back door of the church as we used to do, and this guy came out and just blasted me about church music. I mean, just let me have it. And I remember as a 25-year-old pastor, standing there listening to this guy just lay me, you know, I mean, up one side, down, down the, the other. other. You know, told me if the hymnal was good enough for Paul and Silas, it was good enough for him. You know, and uh, and so I remember thinking consciously, this can't be what's really bothering him, mm. because church music is like twenty minutes of your week. Yeah, and if if you 
if it's bothering you so much that you have to lash out, then you've got it made. Not, yeah. I mean, you got it made. If that's the worst thing that's happening to your week. Right. Is this 20 minutes In of music? World, yeah. It. Yeah. And so yeah. I learned then usually what's bothering people is not really what they ask about or they want to have a conversation about or they even want sometimes even want to think about. And so when we when we ask why a lot of times I think it's just we want to feel better. Mm. Yeah. You know, feel better about what I what I like to say is a lot of people want to feel better about what they're they've already decided they're willing to believe. Mm. You know, I just yeah. want to be right. Right. Tell me I'm right. Right. You know, and I'm not right. Well, that's like the you questions know? I was asking all the you. time. Yeah. Like, at, like you're here and then you're not. So how it's hard for the human mind to wrap around that. And one of the things I found with this podcast as I've been going along and why we're sitting here today right. is the first episode I had and I, the gal was speaking, LaWanda Kent was speaking about like towards the end, her God, her Lord, and how that he gave her strength and all this stuff. And at that point I hadn't, I, I kind of yeah. did one of these like, yeah. uh oh, is that going to be a hot topic? Is that going to, yeah. and then at the end she's like, oh, should I have said that? And I said, you know what? That's your story. Of course you should have said that. Right. And I kind of said, whatever comes up, comes up for a reason. And I, and I, have felt that way and pretty I would say everyone who's been on the podcast there is as you said a connectivity and it's higher source power energy whatever you want to call it it yeah has has always been a motivating force of the people who have found a bigger better purpose for themselves and for their lives and to serve others has been everyone who's been on this podcast. And I think that's what we're all trying to strive for is we're here on this earth to do what? And then when the last breath is taken, we want to feel good about that and what that looks like. And, and it's sometimes it's depressing to think you, you don't know. So I dive into the whole near-death experience thing, th thinking that that's going to help. Oh, well, they saw this and this and this, and that sounds pretty good. I could probably go there, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. But before we dive into that, how did you even get started with something that, I mean, it's not proven, <laughs> well, right? No, well, it's not nothing, proven. Well, nothing is really proven, is okay. it? I mean, okay. I mean, I mean, think about it. Uh, you, you can't prove that uh, 45 minutes ago you walked through those doors over there. You can't prove it. You know, somebody might say, well, there's some video, you know, you got video surveillance yeah. equipment. Well, what if it's CGI'd? I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, there's nothing... There's nothing that is absolutely positively provable. You know, I, I love, uh, you know, I love the, uh, the English language because it is so fluid and so archaic and inadequate, mm -hmm. but, but everybody in the world uses it, you know, and it has rules except where the rules don't apply. Like, you know, <laughs> I before E except after C. Yeah. Weird, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so here's the thing. Um, I know, I know there's a sun, even when I don't see it. Okay. Right. 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 I know there's oxygen, even though I can't touch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you know, I, I know there is life, even though I can't fully define it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And why? Why do I believe any of those things? Because somebody has told me. Therein lies the thing. Well, and so then you have to trust 
the person who's telling you. So let's, yeah. let's go down that rabbit hole. Okay. So you grew up, you were telling me, um, you're one, you're the oldest son oldest of, of five. 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 Well, four boys and a girl. Okay. Four boys, four and, boys a and a princess. And a princess. Yeah. <laughs> and your father, you said when you were young, uh, sort of had an awakening. Yeah. Like I was like 18 months old. Oh, that's pretty young. Yeah. Well, yeah. My dad was in the Navy when I was born and, mm -hmm. uh, he, he got out not long after I was born, and he and my mom came back to Atlanta, which was, you know, my dad is a fourth-generation Atlanta boy. And um, and so, uh, you know, they settled in, and, and uh, my mom um, had drunk, gone, gone to church there close to where they moved to, and so as soon as they moved back, she started going to church. She started inviting him every Sunday, you know, won't you go to church with your son and I? And, and uh, he, he went uh, one Sunday. Yeah, I think he, honestly, I think he went just so she would shut up. Yeah, probably. You know? And uh, <laughs> just leave him alone. And the preacher said this, uh, you know, if Jesus, if Jesus is not real, then what, you know, what's the worst that can happen, you know, hmm. but if he is real and we, we don't embrace, you know, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness and love, then that, that has a huge impact. And, um, uh, and so uh, he he said, "You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna give my life to to Jesus." And just you know, like my that? dad, my well, my dad was. Uh, I don't think it was just like that. See, that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, why? Why did he do that? Well, you know, his his parents. Uh, were they they went to church nominally you know so he had some of that uh his his great uh grandfather you know was very i've got his bible and uh you know he was very uh, plugged in uh to the whole discipleship of jesus you know model and so, all, you know, all of those things are connected, but the Apostle Paul says, you know, one person plants, another waters, mm. but God makes it grow. And so mm. he just, he was, you know, the seed was planted long enough, it was watered enough, and then it, it, it grew okay. on that day. And my dad was always the kind of person that, you know, he believed in giving your best effort, whatever you did, you know. Uh, it, it, you don't have to do it perfectly. You just do your best. Do your best. You know, and uh, and so that's that's what he did. He said, you know, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, then I'm going to be the best follower of Jesus that I can. And uh, wow. So you know, I grew up in a home where my dad owned a hardware store, but he had a he had like three sets of Bible commentaries, and he studied the Bible every day and. And uh, he didn't only study it; he also practiced it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, he, but he he kept learning, kept growing, kept yeah. kept maturing, and uh, and so you know, by the time I was nine years old, I mean, I had been in church every Sunday. Yeah. Of my life, in fact, I'm sixty three years old, and by actual count. I think I've missed church six times in 63 years. Wow. You know, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, incredible. Well, that's because incredible. my dad, not, be, you know, not because I have to, it's not, see, that's the thing. I was talking to uh, our 18 to 30 group last night. Um, and I told them, I said, you see, one of the big shifts is, and this, you know, you, you probably can, 
understand this a lot better than some people who've grown up in the church. But when you make the shift between what you have to do and what you get to do, mm, it yeah. changes things. It does change things. You know? And so. It changes everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't have to uh, do anything. I get to do a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. So you were surrounded by the church and grew up with it. Yeah. You were going, you missed only six. Six Sundays in, in 63, 63 years. years. And I, and, and that, you know, that's what, that's the whole, you don't have to, you get to get mentality. To. You know, that's sure. It's not, it's not, so, I don't have to do it. I get to do it, right. you know, uh, because I, I believe that there is a God who loves us okay. and cares for us. And, and you also grew up, um, your father, I love that story you told me, that your father would put together these gigantic baskets. Yeah, yeah. The, we'd go to the farmer's market over in Forest Park. He would buy these baskets. They were about that big around, about that deep. And they were, they had uh, red and green, you know, woven yeah, yeah. into them. And uh, they had metal handles on it. I remember that because oh, wow. it was kind of tough for little hands, you know. Mm. And when I was, when I was younger, like 10, 11, and my brother was eight and nine, you know, uh, we would each carry a side because, the, at Thanksgiving, my dad would put these turkeys, frozen turkey, and he would put uh, like, uh, like canned, all the provisions, yeah, right? Yeah, all for the provisions a for meal. Thanksgiving yeah. meal, and then a bunch of fruit. You know, oh he, he 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 cracked me up because he he loved kumquats. I don't have you do you know even know what a kumquat I do. is? Yeah, he loved kumquats, and so at Christmas time, everybody would get a basket with a little bag of kumquats in it. And I'm thinking, you know, most of those people are like going, what is this? One but, uh, yeah. So, um, but at Thanksgiving, he would make like 50 of these baskets and Thanksgiving and Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas, we would load them up, uh, and we would take them to people who were struggling financially or, or some other thing going on in their life. Maybe, you know, somebody significant had passed away or something like that. And we would put them on the porch and we would knock on the door and run and away. Run. Yeah, so and that nobody would know. Nobody would know. Yeah. Well, why'd you yeah. run? Yeah. So, so nobody would know. know. And it was like a big game for us, you know, kids. And then, of course, as I grew older and, you know, into my teens and everything, I began to understand, um, you know, why we, why we were doing what we were doing. And, uh, but, uh, that was, you know, my dad, uh, he really, he really modeled it for me. Yeah. Your and, father was yeah. a pillar, pillar in the community and, and you <laughs> yeah. came from a, a lineage of politicalness. <laughs> yeah. It was, well, so I tell people, if your family has been in the state of Georgia for more than four generations, I'm probably related to you. Um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, most people don't get this, but, in 1830, Atlanta wasn't even a city, mm. you know, it was a wide spot in the road. Literally, it oh, was wow. a, it was terminus. It was a Didn't place where the railroads came together. And, uh, and so, you know, by the time Atlanta was born, New York had been around for 200 years. Oh, wow. You put it like that. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. Right. So, um, so I mean, in 1936, when my daddy was born, mm -hmm. and my grandmother, my great-grandmother owned a house there on Edgewood Avenue, uh, right off of Five Points, 814 Edgewood Avenue. Uh, you know, um, everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody. And, and they were, you know, I've got a book in my office entitled Fielding Dillard and His Descendants. And uh, <laughs> Fielding Dillard was 
uh, the like the 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 beginning point for the Dillard, my side of the Dillard family in Georgia. Okay. Okay. And uh, in the back, of, the book is about that thick. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and in the back of that book is a you know an appendix with all of the names of all the families that are connected to the Dillards in there. And my wife and I, we've been afraid to, you know, cause she's a Barnes and there are Barnes in there. So we haven't explored that too much. Oh. Yeah. Cause <laughs> we may be cousins. Uh, you know, I mean, so, uh, yeah. but, uh, you know, so a lot of people, uh, that we, we grew up, my great, my, and this may not mean anything to a lot of people that are listening, but Herman Talmadge, his father was Eugene Talmadge, who was governor of Georgia, who really kind of brought Georgia into the 20th century. Uh, I'm not saying he was an altogether decent person, morally and ethically, but when he became governor, like only like 20% of the roads in Georgia were paved. And when, when he left yeah. the governor's office like 65 percent of the roads he was forward thinking he was he was forward thinking but anyway my great grandmother changed his diapers wow yeah so because you know he's a cousin and uh, mm -hmm. you know herman the third is a cousin of mine and you know we stay connected on facebook and stuff like that but so lots of yeah. people lots of avenues and it's interesting. So you're you're going through life and you're 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 into it all. You like it. You said it was great. Yeah. You worked really hard in the hardware store. Yeah. And your your father um, treated everyone with respect. Yeah. And my expected dad. you to do the same. My dad. Uh, when my dad went into the hardware business in the '60s, uh, there were two hardware stores in Fairburn. Uh, <laughs> oddly enough. At that time, they were right next door to each other. Hmm. And uh, and so the one hardware hmm. store did not allow people of color to come in the front mm. door. And my dad allowed everybody to come in the front door. And actually, you know, we uh, my dad took some heat for that. I mean, they, somebody threw a brick through the one of the store yeah. windows, you know, and uh, with some not nice stuff on it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my dad was like, uh, I don't answer to people, I answer to God. And, uh, and God told me everybody matters. Everybody has value. Wow. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. That's amazing back, yeah. back then. Yeah. And you're but in that's the South. The, but you're that's, in the South. Yeah. In the South, you know, and, uh, but as I said earlier, you know, the why is not, it's not just because my dad was some you know, intellectual, you know, or, or, you know, the pioneer is because, uh, when he was born right after, you know, four years after he was born, my grandfather's in the Navy fighting world war two. Mm -hmm. My grandmother's working and this woman of color named Jimmy raised my dad till he was like 12 years old. She was his caretaker. You know, and uh, the first time I ever saw my dad cry was was we visited Jimmy in her home uh, a week before she passed. Oh. You know, and so he loved her, had experienced love from her, and so he was able to decipher you know, through life experiences and what he was learning through the word of God that skin color really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, I love when, when I went to uh, Ghana the very first time, they, they called me Bruni, uh, which means pink. <laughs> uh, so I'm not white. I'm actually pink. And uh, so, you know, but, uh, but that's, uh, you know, it, it, pig, I mean, you know, somebody said it way before me, but three centimeters down, we're all the same. Oh, absolutely. Tissue's yeah. still the same. Yeah. Doesn't show yeah. color. Right. And so if, if, if it doesn't matter to God, my dad's 
philosophy was if it doesn't matter to God, it should matter to us. Right. And so everybody, uh, you know, everybody respected my dad, um, except the people that were so far gone. Right. You know, the, the superiority of the races and all that kind of stuff. Those were the ones throwing bricks. Right. But the, the everyday people, they knew, you know, they knew my dad was somebody that they could depend on to do the right thing. And, and, but, you ne- but you never thought that you weren't thinking like when you were in high school and college and you were playing football and things like that, that you were going to end up preaching. No, I, I, I even though it was part of your life, it wasn't really. Yeah. I told God I would, I, I told God I would honestly do anything that he wanted me to do except preach. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and why would you even say that though? Right? Because, why would you even say because except I, preach? B- because I knew that's what he wanted me to do. Oh, you knew in your gut? Yeah. What'd that look like? How old were you? I was nine. You were nine when you yeah. knew? Yeah. They do say between the ages of seven and nine, somewhere in there, seven and 12, that era, that the things you love to do and the things you believe in generally are the direction you're supposed to go in. I've, I've yeah. heard this. Yeah. That's very uh, interesting. Oh. But you, but you, you knew that in your gut for whatever yeah. reason. But you're like, well, you know, I yeah. don't really want to do that. Yeah. I, well, you know, I was God. I kept telling God, you know, I can, I can help you more. You know, in this way. Right. You want to be. Kind, you were studying to be a lawyer, right? I, I thought I would get a degree in political science and then go oh, and to law school. And, yeah. Go to law school and, and then, then once get I into got your... out of law school, you know, get into politics and right. Yeah, eventually run for president. There you go. Yeah, there it is. I see nothing yeah. wrong with that. Well, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's <laughs> just wasn't my path. Wasn't your path. Yeah. How'd you find out it wasn't your path? Uh because <laughs> you started down that road. I start well, say at, at nine years of age I was I was baptized and when you know the pastor of the church asked me, why did I want to be baptized? I said, so because I love Jesus and because I want to be a preacher. And, hmm. uh, and I think it was, I mean, I, I really believe it was pure at that point. And then a couple of years down the road, uh, the, the preacher that baptized me, the church just made his life miserable. Oh, you saw the politics. Yeah, of it he almost had a nervous breakdown, oh my gosh. and uh, ended up moving to California to to get away from us. And, like anything uh, yeah. else, there's people, there's yeah. emotions. Well, and so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I love I loved him. He was mm-hmm. brilliant, brilliant man. And uh, but didn't you? But you didn't like. I, I, what was happening to I him because I, of his yeah, role? Yeah, just because, and I could see it. It was yeah. not because he was controversial. It was just because they didn't want to do church the way he wanted to do church, or the way that he understood church. And you know, that's that's been my thing, uh, and that's what I learned from him. And uh, that I I don't. And Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul says this, I, I don't I don't answer to anybody. I answer to God. Mm-hmm. And uh and so um So that turned you off a little bit. It turned me off that that, that they were just so mean to him and hurt him so bad and his family. And uh and then uh but then he went and had this beautiful ministry right across the street from UCLA. Mm. Uh and I got a chance uh, in my 30s to go spend a, uh, two weeks with him, just me and him, mm-hmm. every day for like five hours. Wow. You know, That's and him just pouring into me. And But, uh, you know, and he shared some things with me that helped me to understand uh and of course, a lot of stuff my dad had told me, uh, you know, um, was that people don't define you. 
they can't, you know. Uh, and I, I, so because of that, I often say just because you disagree with me does not mean I'm wrong, mm. you know. So, uh, but we live in a culture right now that says, you know, hey, if I disagree with you, you're wrong. Uh, and if the world disagrees with you, you're wrong. And that's not entirely true. Uh, it can be, but it's not entirely true. And, and so, um, I went to CIY, Christ in Youth Conference. Before you were going to go. Yeah, I was going to go headed off to college, uh, at the end of the summer. And, uh, the guy that was speaking said, Every day, you know, after this session, I want you to take your Bible. I want you to go out. I want you to just, just sit alone. You know, I don't want you to be with anybody else. And I want you to just ask God what he wants you to do. What's mm -hmm. the one thing that he made you for? What is, what is your sweet spot, so to speak, you know? Gosh, I don't even know if I, how do you do that? Yeah, Just well. sit there against you know, a tree with a Bible and. Yeah, what, what was funny, not funny, ha-ha, funny, strange, is so, you know, I go out there, first session. Yeah. Yeah, after the first session, I go out there. It's in Johnson City, Tennessee, on the campus of Milligan College. I sit on the side of a hill by myself, open the Bible, and right there in, you know, almost like. You just randomly opened it. Yeah, just I just let it fall open. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and there it says, preach the word in season and out of season. Preach. Yeah. Preach. Yeah, preach the word. Preach the word. <laughs> Which, uh, you know. I and knew. you took that as. Well, I knew that's what he wanted me Yeesh. to do. How'd you grapple with that? Uh, it took, uh, you know, it was that was Monday afternoon and it took till thursday afternoon. Til thursday. yeah <laughs> i was like yeah you know, okay i'm gonna do this a few more know, times and we'll yeah, see if we come yeah. on the same thing did you keep coming on the same thing no, no no not on the same thing but you know it would be like you know i'd open the bible and it'd be philip in telling the ethiopian about jesus from isaiah 53 and uh or you know just something, something along those lines, mm. you know, and kind of reiterating. Yeah. It. And, yeah. And then on Thursday, you know, it says go into all the world and tell them the good news, mm. you know, and how, can, you know, I had to ask myself, how can, how can you do that best? You know, what's, what's the best way that George Dillard can do that? And, and I felt like it was, you know, I'd always been told. I started teaching s Sunday school for small children at 15. Yeah. And by the time I was 18, I was teaching an adult you were Sunday school adults. class. Yeah. yeah. And they were like, you just have a gift. You have a oh, gift. Oh, so you, know? you had been peppered along the way. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, they just, you know, I, they, they, they're like, you, and I even get this to this day. I mean, I think you've even said something similar that I, God has just gifted me with a way of explaining it that's different than a lot of other people that well, you've just, heard. Or, it's just real. Yeah. It, you could just apply it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know. So you call your dad and say, okay, I call my I'm dad. I said, my yeah, I said, so, hey, what would you say if I told you I was going to Atlanta Christian College and I was going to go into ministry? He said, well, I would say I'm glad you finally figured it out. Finally figured it out. Yeah. And mm. and I love you and go to bed. Because <laughs> it was at at 1 30 in the morning. in the morning you and called he, your dad. Well, and he, had, he opened the hardware store at 7. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird that you called him that late, huh? You just had to. Yes. I got you. Yeah, I had to. He had to know. And then you started your ministry. No regrets. Well, then I went to Bible college, which that was oh, yeah, a, you had to that was an interesting college. experience because uh, 
I went to Bible college and, and, uh, I didn't really fit in. Um, and, um, I you yeah, didn't fit in. Well, I've been, I, you know, I had, you were uh, the football player guy. Yeah. I've been planning my whole life to, to play football right. for four years. Yeah. Uh, and then the rest of life was going to come, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, like, for example, when I went to Atlanta Christian College, they had a rule that you couldn't wear jeans to uh, class. Oh, my. But I didn't find that out until I'm sitting in orientation. In jeans. The week before classes start. And so, I mean, I grew up in a hardware store. Yeah. <laughs> I had one pair of dress pants. Oh, gosh. One pair. That's stressful. I mean, I even wore jeans to church a lot which was not, I mean, well, it wasn't popular in the 70s. Mm -mm. Yeah. And uh, so I just went to the president of the college and went, I'm going to have to withdraw. <gasps> and he's like, why? And I went, I don't have it. I don't have enough money to pay y'all and to buy a new wardrobe. Wow. And so, and so they changed the rules. Stop it. You no, know, they changed the rules and let us wear you ended up changing the dress code. I changed the dress code. Uh, they, you know, and uh, <laughs> they let us wear jeans for the first time to class if they were good, you know, if they were respectable make, jeans, yeah. no patches, no holes. Nobody could, today could go to oh. class. Like <laughs> yeah. We're paying for everybody looks, half these jeans are missing and I have to pay everybody for Everybody looks like they've been attacked by a wild dog or I something. Know. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> what? We got in a fight with a <laughs> weed eater or something. I don't know. You know, it's, it's true. It's and you're paying more money yeah. and half the material's not there. Right. Yeah. It's bizarre. Okay. All right. So, but you make it through. So I go to Bible college. This is really, this is really funny. Um, I go to Bible college and I take this class called homiletics. Do you know what homiletics no. is? Yeah. Most people don't. Uh, it, uh, it's the definition of homiletics is the, uh, the, the science of sermon construction and the systematic setting forth of an oral address. I had to learn. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had to learn that. It's like public speaking, speaking yeah. for it's, ministry. Yeah. It's, and, uh, oh, wow. So, um, well, that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. So it's in, it's, this is like 1978. And uh, <laughs> so you, you're in class mm -hmm. and you got all your peers mm -hmm. you're preaching mm -hmm. and and they had a video recorder one of those gigantic oh. boxes and they recorded it and then they played it back in front of your peers and crit everybody critiqued you oh. while you're sitting in the room oh. yeah so i preached my my sermon it was uh, supposed to be 15 minutes. It was seven and a half. Ooh. Longest seven and a half minutes of my life. <laughs> uh, it was horrible. Was it horrible? It was. It was terrible. Uh, and Did the, everybody else think it was horrible? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. Okay. Well, the, but the, the professor said, uh, he's got a good voice. Ah. Uh. He has a good voice. He really has a good voice. I mean, that's the only positive thing. Maybe we said. can dress up this pig well, and send so, it out. <laughs> so, man, I'm like, I'm like, God, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? Did you doubt? You made me go to, you made me go to Bible college and now, you know, they're going to kick me that, out because yeah. I, I stink. And uh, so I went, I went back to the dorm and I'm sitting there in my room. And back in those days, it's pay phones in the hall. And the phone rings, and this guy comes to my door and says, Dr. Hay, we'd like to speak to you on the phone. I'm like, great, man. It's not, it's not even been two hours, you know. And he's going to kick and me Dr. out. And Dr. Hay is who? The, the homiletics professor. Oh, the professor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, he goes, can you come to my office? And I'm like, yeah. He knew. He yeah. knew you were like. Yeah. So I went to his office. In a weird way. <laughs> and he, he said, son. He goes, look, you learned a very valuable lesson today. I went, yeah, I stink. And he goes, no, uh, it's not about you. Mm. Never has been, never will be. 
It's about Jesus. And what you have to do is you love Jesus. You trust Jesus and he'll take care of it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then everything else will line up. And so I went back to class the next day and, you know, and stayed in Bible college. And Wait, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to have faith that it'll all just come together. Is yeah. that? No. Uh, not, is that what he's saying to you? No, he's what he's saying to me is to trust trust God in his process. Okay. See, he had to teach How me something. How does that help you not get I an thought, F in the class? Well, uh, well, it, it wasn't it, to me. It wasn't about passing the class. It was about doing my best. Okay. And I thought my best relied on me. Oh. Yeah. See, and uh, I mean, how can I communicate? the wisdom of God. And that's what you had to figure out. Yeah. And, and, and not, not because I'm talented, not because I'm gifted. You know, I mean, there are a lot of people out there way, way more gifted than I am, you know? Uh, but it's one of my friends used to introduce me. He said, this is George Dillard. He's crazy as can be, but he loves Jesus more than anybody I know. Hmm. And, you know, I determined a long time ago when, that when it comes to that last day here, yeah, then there's only two things that matter. Who you loved uh -huh. and who loved you. Okay. Hey, that's it. Because love's the only thing you're going to take out of here. Love's the only thing you're going to leave here. Because you may leave your kids $400 million, but eventually it'll be gone. Yeah, everything goes right. away. Except for love. Because God is love, therefore love is eternal. That's why Jesus said, here's... Here, you guys want to know how to how to truly be my followers? Love one another. Yeah. Yeah. By this will people know that you belong to me if you have love one for the other. And so, you know, and as I, you know, share, I have shared with you before, my, my dad taught me that you owe the same respect to the janitor as the CEO. You Absolutely. Know, I, I grew just, up that, that yeah, way. Yeah. People doesn't matter what you do as long matter. as you're doing your best. And yeah. You can love be proud people. of it. Yeah. Just love people. Okay. All right. So you're doing it and you've how long have you actually been preaching? Uh well, I was ordained on June thirteenth, nineteen eighty two. So Ooh, we're almost four days, it'll be forty years. Forty? Years. Yeah. Any regrets? No. None. None. Okay. The only, the, the only, I guess the only regret I got is I didn't meet Renee sooner. Oh, yeah. his beautiful wife. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She, I mean, but she, you, she's she my wasn't part. ready to meet you sooner. No, I wasn't ready to meet her. Right. Yeah. See? I was, uh, I was still learning, mm -hmm. still growing. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I love, I love Jesus. I love the church. And, you know, it's tough, but uh, so so is owning in the restaurant. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's but just a different kind of tough. It's just a different kind of tough. But, you're yeah. but we, are, we, my husband and I, have, he's, he's come around to this. But it's almost like a ministry. Yeah, it is. Because we've helped sure. so many people on their path. Well, that's doing why I it every day. What, whatever you do. In word or deed, mm -hmm. do it as for the Lord. See, here's the thing, and this I've tried to share this uh, with people for a long, long time, and but it seems to be resonating with people more and more, especially once they found out the last couple of years that guess what? If I don't go to the office, the world isn't falling apart. But anyway, um, so. I can tell people things about Jesus that you have not even discovered yet. You know, 
I mean, I've been, I've been afforded the opportunity to study the Bible mm. every day for multiple hours, you know, for years. Right. For and over 40 years. All the different takes yeah. on it. And everything. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, I did a, you know, Carrie Cottrell, don't mm-hmm. you? Yeah. So Carrie, friend of ours, she was in a Bible study with me one time and I did a, I did like 30 minutes on two verses in first Corinthians. And, and when the class was over, Carrie goes, I just feel dumb. And I went, why? And she goes, there's no way I would have got that out of, you know, that. Just reading and it. I went, yeah. so Carrie, how, how much, how much time do you get to spend in the Bible every day? And, and she told me, and I said, you know, honestly, I spend, I spent most of my life spending more time in the Bible in a day than you do in a week. Yeah, yeah. And I said, and that's not me and bragging. You're di- and you're dissecting it. That's not me bragging. Right. That's the way God said he's appointed some to preach and some to teach. And so, yeah. and, and so here's the thing, though. I can, I can share all kind of stuff with people that, that they've never thought of before, but only if they come here. See, mm-hmm. and 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 so you and your husband can reach people in that restaurant that are not going to come here yet. They may mm-hmm. because of their of the relationship that you have with them, mm-hmm. and eventually where you lead them to. But I would on a on an everyday walking around the world kind of basis, I wouldn't have any contact with those people. You know? Right. And that's where you, where that's you why. and I were talking yesterday. Like, I was like, well, yeah, but if you had become president, imagine the platform you would have had, right? And reaching all the people. And your comment to me was, I can do as much, if not more good, sitting in here because everyone that's in here goes out. It's like a ripple effect. Yeah. Right. Well, and not only that, but I can't as the president of the United States, as you well know. Uh, oh, it gets very gobbledy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of yeah, a thing. It, it's, you know, I don't even here, know, here's the thing. It's all about, and I tell people, it's all about give and take. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can only take so much and you can only give so much. And mm-hmm. you've got to have people, regardless of what they say, what the rhetoric is during the election cycle, you got to have people who agree with you and disagree with you, who can get along with you, you know, and, and, and they, you have handlers and sensors and yeah. I mean, you try to, I mean, you try to have an, a, you try to have a meeting with the president, mm. you know, you're not going to, it's not going to happen. Right. You know, right. Uh, you're right. And so, uh, there's only, honestly, you know, there's only a few people that really know what that individual really thinks. Right. And so, uh, he, and I, I doubt that any of them, in the last 25, 30 years have really just completely opened up and been absolutely transparent and said, Hey, right. this is the way I live. This is what I think. Right. Okay. And you know, I mean, you know, you, you've been here. I, You're transparent. You know, I'm, what you see is what you get. Which I, is one I, of the reasons it's so good. Well, thank you. But I <laughs> try to be, today on Thursday, you know, what I am on Sunday. Yeah. And I try to be on Sunday what I am on Monday, Mm -hmm. you know, because that's one of the things that I, I've always believed is that I can't tell you something that I don't know or believe in. Okay. You know. Okay. Since you opened that door. Yeah. So how do you know 
How do you know? How do you know for certain that there is a God and that there is a Jesus? Uh, That's a good question, right? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I really believe that the complexity of the creation whole Dem universe thing, right? Yeah, Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, demands a, demands a creator. Hmm. I don't think it's, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's an accident. Uh, I may not understand it all, you know, I certainly don't, uh, but I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand trigonometry. Mm. You know, I'm like, let's just do math, you know, and, uh, <laughs> But uh, so uh, just because I don't understand it doesn't mean it's so or not so. Right. You know, uh, here's. Well, how do you tell somebody like me, for example, if it was somebody like me. Okay. Who wants to believe, who, who finds solace in doing the right thing, believing that. There is that law of attraction. What you put out is what you get back. All yeah. that stuff, right? And as I'm walking in the woods Which with my the, friend, she's like, you know, that's actually religion, what you're saying. Yeah, actually, like, I was oh, going to say all of that stuff is in the is, is Bible. Is in the Bible, right? Yeah. Which I didn't know. And, yeah. and I go, oh, and then I heard this, and then I did that. She goes, that's in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, yeah. it is? Yeah. Maybe I need to rethink. Yeah. So we. So what do you tell somebody like me? Well, so um, here's the thing. Uh I guess for me, the biggest thing is that the Bible and everything in it hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Because. Which is a story that well, we're being told. Hold on. Hold okay. On, hold, okay. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's this, here's this, this thing that changes everything. Okay. okay. Because Paul says. Because of the resurrection, we say, death, where's your victory? Grave, where's your sting? Okay? Because all the venom, you know, all the teeth has been pulled out of death. You know, it's not, okay. it's, it's not something to be feared. Now it's just a doorway. Yeah, that's what you said yesterday. Yeah. It's a doorway. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, I like that. Yeah. And so, so here's the thing. This, I know human nature. And, uh. Let's say, you know, you are, you're involved in a, a group, an organization, whatever you want to call it, and you know what they're putting out there is not true. Mm -hmm. But it's doing good. It's helping people. It's making a difference. Okay. But then the authorities come. Okay. And they say, shut up, or we're going to kill you. And they've already killed some of your friends in the group. Hmm. Okay? So what do you do? You stop talking, or you just keep on? Well, that's the thing. You look back, and you find all these people that kept talking, and I'm like, gosh, it would have been a lot easier if you just did it on your own. And believed what you believed but didn't go out and yell it and then you wouldn't have died but that but see is not horrible that i think but no, i think that but, I mean, no no it's not horrible a lot of people think it's, yeah self-preservation is is the way that most of humanity thinks but here's the thing uh would it hurt to just say okay fine and but you don't have to like you're not writing it in your blood with them you're just saying yeah okay i'll be quiet now and but in your privacy of your own home you can do what you want well then that's not moral or ethical is it Oh. So. Okay. So here's these guys, these eleven guys. Yes. They're scared to death. Mm hmm. They're in hiding. Mm hmm. And then something happens. And they're standing in the temple. And they're saying, "The same Jesus whom you've crucified. God has made him both King and Savior." Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So the people that orchestrated Jesus' trial okay, and his execution grab them, pull them out of the temple, take them into uh, a courtroom and say, if you don't, stop talking about Jesus. Resurrection, then we're going to put you to death. And they're like, well, go ahead. Because see, death uh, is not. It's so brave. Well, death is not a thing. It's a doorway. Okay. See, the, here's the thing. This is, this is where you have to get. Wendy, is they can't take something from you that they don't own. That they can't own. Right? Which you would say, I is believe, your, is, is your, your soul life. and your yeah. spirit. Yeah. My, my life this, belongs. This goes away. Right. My life belongs to Jesus. They, okay. they can't take something from me that they can't possess. They can take my money, take my phone, take my car. You know, and uh, as Rodney Dangerfield said, take my wife, please. No, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, but they, they can take a lot of things, but they can't take my life because. Yeah, it's like people who sit in a, in a, in a prison cell for years on years and years and then stay positive. Like um, in the um, Stoics and. Marcus Aurelius and, yeah. and all these people who, who find philosophy is to answer the questions, right? So, and, and it's within them. So just, just ask yourself, what gives, what, what moves somebody from being in hiding mm. to standing up and pointing at the people that they're hide, they've been hiding from and saying, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both king and savior. See, I know human nature, and I know this. People will die for a lot of things, but they will not die for a lie that they know is a lie. Right? Right. And so, oh, so you're saying, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. You're saying that people were willing and have die. been willing to die. Because they knew. Because they believe it's the truth. No, they know it's the truth. They know it's the truth. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So. What has been, I'm sure there's many, but what's, what's the one, have you had like one big takeaway from your 40 years? One thing. If you could only name one thing about your 40-year history of preaching. What would that be? Uh, blameless. Blameless. Yeah. Explain. Explain that. Okay. So um, I'm an athlete or was. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, you need to get in shape. I said, this is a shape. <laughs> Not a good one, but it is. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I was an athlete, and I can honestly say uh, played football, baseball, Basketball, ran track, played golf, shot archery. Never had a perfect match. Never had a perfect game. Not personally. Mm -hmm. Okay, never had a perfect one. But I can guarantee you this. Uh, when I walked onto the court, when I walked onto the field, and I was giving you everything I had. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between perfect and blameless. See, I can honestly stand before God and say, I did my best. I did mm -hmm. my best. It may not have been good enough, but it's all I had to give. See, Jesus is standing in the temple treasury and people are coming in, they're dropping all these large sums of money, you know, in. And this woman weaves her way through the crowd. She drops two copper coins in the treasury. And, uh, and Jesus says, hey, hey, guys, I want you to see something. This woman gave more than everybody here. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I've studied human nature quite a bit. And I know I've looked at Peter's response to a lot of things. And I can almost 
hear the apostle Peter going, well, Jesus, I'm no mathematician, but that bag that that dude dropped in with all those coins in it was a lot more than those two two. popper coins. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, see, that's, that's the problem. And this, this is a paraphrase, of course. Jesus says, see, that's the problem. You're looking at the amount, not the heart. Say, yeah, he gave out of his abundance. She gave everything she had to live on. Okay. Mm. So the thing is, it's, it's not even about us doing the same thing. It's about us doing our best. And, you know, when I, when I have an opportunity to teach or to share, uh, to preach, then I'm, I'm doing, I'm giving my, I'm giving my best, you know, and that's all, that's all anybody can do. And, and, you know, the, the scripture teaches us that, that we're to be blameless. And what that means is that I can honestly walk off the court and say, I did my best. You know, I like to tell the story, uh, a few years ago, my son was in sixth grade. He came home. He said, I, I want to set the record for the mile for sixth grade, my school. Okay. And I said, okay, what do you got to do? He said, I got to, I got to shave like 29 seconds off my mile oh, time. It's a lot. Well, I said, I know how to do that. And he goes, really? Really? I was, yeah. He used to run track. He goes, how, how do I do it? I said, Run harder. Yeah. He goes, I thought you were going to help me. Oh. And I said, no. Well, he, goes, he probably thought you were going to train him a little well, bit, Well, he right? goes, I thought you were going to help me because I am running as hard as I can. I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I run as hard as I can. I said, so when you cross the finish line, when you cross the timeline, you go over into the infield, you fall on your knees, and you throw up. And he goes, no. And I went, well, then you're not running as hard as you can. Okay, can we just, just, just so you know, yeah, it's bizarre that you just said that, because I was talking to my coach, and she was telling me, well, Wendy, you know, you keep circling it back around the same thing. We keep talking about the same stuff. You're just not going where you need to go. You're just not headed in that direction. You're not. I, I, I forget. You, but then, but you're not but, all in. Not all in. And I yeah. said, you know, it's really interesting. And it made me think of a track analogy. I ran track. Right. That I would run the mile, and I went to the States in the mile, I did all that, and, but my coach was always on my butt because I would, I would somehow, that last 200, yeah. I would be like, oh, I'm almost done, good, and I would turn on the gas. Yeah. And that's when I would make my moves and, uh, you know, and, and when the race or come in second or whatever it was, and my coach would, and I'd be like, yay, and then we get the points, and, the, and he'd be like, you should not have that much gas at the end yeah. of the race. Right. You're not it's okay to have some gas. as best yeah. as, as you can. can. Right. And I'm like, I wonder how that applies in my life. Am I turning off the gas too, am I not turning on the gas soon enough because I'm afraid of what will happen at the end? Right. Collapsing at the end. Yeah. Well, will I not believe because I'm afraid of what I'll see? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, see, that's, you know, yeah. So, so what's interesting is he, he's, I said, then you're not running as hard as you can. Yeah. You know, you're not. And, uh, so he, but kinda, that's not what we want to hear. But yeah. So he went off. He was kind of upset. Yeah. And then, uh, a week later he comes in and he goes, uh, I set the mile, I set the record in the mile. I said, you did? He said, I sure did. I said, did you cross the timeline, go over the end field and throw up? He said, I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know. He, he, oh, that's interesting. He, yeah. So wow. uh, here, here's the thing. And I just, I went. But through. none of us really want to throw up. Yeah, but here's the thing. At the end. You know, everybody says, you know, Save for the future, save for the future, save for the future. When it comes, yeah, it's in when, it comes when it comes to wealth, you know, yeah. and everything. And I'm like, why? The unknown. But if there is no f- future. Well, the unknown. The unknown yeah. is the unknown. Yeah, but but see, 
if I, it, it, here's the thing. If I believe what I say, I believe. Mm-hmm. And as James, as James says in his letter to the church, if you encounter somebody who is cold and hungry, you can't just say to them, we'll be warm and be filled. Okay. You actually have to give them some food and give them a jacket. And so if I'm sitting there with half a million and a bank account waiting for the end and there are people in Guatemala living on $7 a week and I can give them a house for $1,500. Mm-hmm. You know, what good is it going to do me to save that money? Mm-hmm. And uh, Not saying you shouldn't be able to take care of yourself. Uh, yeah, but I mean, but really. But to what, to yeah, what, to what extent? To what extent? Yeah. yeah. You know. How much do you really need versus how much do you really want? Of course, yeah. A lot of the younger audience maybe that might view this uh, won't probably won't even know who Howard Hughes is. But <laughs> at one time, Howard Hughes was wealthier than all but two nations in the world. An individual. An I didn't individual, know that. yeah. I didn't know that. And somebody asked him one time, Howard, how much money is enough? Oh. He said, one more dollar. Wow. And, you know, what good, what good does it profit somebody if they gain everything in the world and give up their soul? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I I fight the battle all the time. People, I'm like, yeah, I don't have I don't have a lot in savings. Uh, but so, are you? Do you believe in the rainy day theory? Yeah, I believe have it enough. rains. <laughs> but I have enough to like in case something bad happens, so you can. Do you believe in that? Hmm. You don't. No. Oh. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really. I'm, but I'm. Is that because you have faith that everything just kind of works out? I just believe that my. I believe I have big. I t- told Renee this the other day. I you said, know, so we have big challenges, but uh, we have a bigger God. Mm. Yeah. Well, let me ask so. you this. Do you believe what the big, the, the big talk on the town? And I've had people on my podcast before who are like, manifest your destiny manifest your happiness this is how follow this follow that you know do your affirmations every morning happiness what you is think is what happens happiness is a choice okay you know i love my dad used to tell this joke i used to love uh that uh <laughs> uh he said you know there's a little boy a father who had two sons Mm-hmm. One little boy was an optimist, one was a pessimist. Okay. You know, and uh, so he he said, can you help with this? You know, and the guy said, sure, yeah. Bring him down here. I'll, I'll straighten him out in a couple of hours. So he takes a little pessimist, puts him in this room full of brand new toys, not even out of the boxes. Okay. Yeah. He says, have fun. Takes a little optimist, puts him in a room with a pile of horse manure. Okay. He says, have fun. Close the door. An hour later, they go by. A little pessimist is sitting there. Nothing's open. They said, why didn't you open? Why didn't you open some doors? He said, they'll just break. Oh. Yeah. They won't What's work. the What's yeah. the use? Yeah. They go in to the where the little optimist is. They don't see him. They call his name. He pops up out of the pile of manure. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? He goes, with this much manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. So. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Happiness is a choice. I happiness. mean, you know. So it's not about creating. It's about deciding that it, yeah. you're happy. Yeah. So do you believe in that whole. My, my, my op- wife asked me just a couple of months ago, do you ever, ever feel like you're just completely overwhelmed? Mm-hmm. Good question. And I said, no. Mm. Why? Because it's bigger, it's bigger than me. Mm-hmm. You know, God's God's got it. And you know, if 
if God wants it to go, it'll go. If he doesn't, it won't. I, I can't make it go. I can't make it stop. And so I just enjoy the ride. You can honestly yeah. say I'm going in that direction. Yeah. Whatever happens, yeah. you just go with it. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. With no judgment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It I, doesn't mean it's bad or good. It just is. It is. You know, I, I, I don't, I genuinely don't dislike anybody. Yeah. I mean, there's Me some either. people I prefer not to spend any time with. Well, yeah, no, no, no. You know, I mean, because but there's you an know, aura and there's a yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. We're we're not. You know, I'm not going to hang out with you if we're robbing banks every day. Right. It's just not. But you know, I associate with all kinds of people. Yeah. You know, and it 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 shocks people in the church sometimes. See that you know, I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, they're like, why? Why would that shock anyone? Yeah, you know, this person is. And I went, yeah. I mean, but the person on the inside is what you're focusing on. Well, but here's the thing. Even if they're not where they need to be. Right. Maybe you're supposed to gonna, come into their life for you yeah, to get how them they there. Go, how are they going to get there unless you show them? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If you could wave your magic wand. There you go. And fix something. Yeah. One thing. If I could. What would it be? I know I'm good, right? No, yeah, I just, <laughs> I think uh, it would be that uh, the people would just quit being mean. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you know. Fix, fix the brokenness of people. That would be mine. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't, I mean, we can't fix their brokenness. Uh, Jesus is the only, can, only one who can and will. Uh, but I would just, uh, you know, I, I just, I just don't understand people. Yeah, you know, I see people pick on people. And we, when we were in, when we were in Bible college, we had this guy in the dorm and he clearly had some issues and it's not very athletic we were playing football out in the front and this one guy just kept abusing him you verbally know. mean no oh like, physically yeah on the football field, oh okay. you know just knocking just him down him. yeah because he didn't know how to square himself and everything mm. and so, you know, um, halfway through the game, I knocked his tail into the holly bushes that were on the side of the field. Uh, we were playing in the front yard of the dorm. And, and somebody said, that, that's not very Christian. And I was like, uh, I don't know. Defending the weak, pretty Christian, mm. you know. Uh, and and uh, so that's where I came up with this analogy. You know, here's here's the thing: tell the truth, tell the whole story, just be honest, be transparent. You know, if your house was on fire and I went running in and said, "Come on, Wendy, let's go. Your house is on fire," and you said, "No, nah, I'm okay," you know. And we argued, and the house was more and more on fire and everything. And finally, I just punched you right in the head, knocked you out, and carried you out in the yard as the house collapsed. Yeah. You know, saved your life, right? Yeah. Now, that's that's a pretty cool story. Yeah. But what if what if you go around telling the story? You know, George Dillard came in my house uninvited, punched me in the head, and left me lying in my front yard. That's a different version. It's all true. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's how you look at it. It's where you're coming from and how you look at it. Right. Everybody's got a talk. Everybody's got a story, and most of them are tough. And most of them aren't true. Well, the well, stories we tell ourselves no, aren't I'm necessarily not, true. Well, but what I'm saying is, everybody's fighting a hard battle. Okay. You know, and so we live in a culture, and I, you know. 
I, I've said this before. We live in a culture where the 15 cent, second sound bite rules. Mm-hmm. See, we, and what I mean by that is I look, you know, say I walk into McGuire's down in Sonoy, mm-hmm. you know, and you just dropped a glass <sighs> and picked it up and cut your hand. Okay. And somebody says to you, hey, Wendy, can you uh, do this trivial thing? And you go, not right now. (laughs) Okay. I understand that, right? Okay. You're in pain. You know, you've. I'm profusely bleeding all over the floor. You know, you got all kinds of things going on. Yeah. But but I just walked in the restaurant. And I go out and go, Wendy. What a um, yeah, man. She's whoo, she's tough. She's yelling at her employees. Oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah, see empathy. Yeah, you have to, under- seek to understand. Seek to understand. Yeah, just quit seek being mean. Yeah. Okay. And my last question. Okay. Is there anything that you wish you could change about your path that you've been on? My personality is such, I wish I, you know, I, I, I would like to have gotten there quicker, mm. you know, but then I have gotten to gotten a lot quicker just, where you are. Yeah. Just where I am, you know, Me- physically, mentally oh, yeah. in your, okay. Me too. Yeah. I mean, I wish I knew the stuff I knew now. Yeah. Wish I knew now. What I didn't know then. Yeah. I wish I do then what I yeah, that know thing. now. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Uh, Man, the time I would have saved and the people I would have well, helped but, and maybe but been But again, to. see, that's part of the path. Right. You have to yeah, learn, right? And, and some of us have to learn in different ways, in different spe- Here's the thing, and this is one of the things I tell the, the church all the time. It's all about direction. Okay? It's not about, it's never about speed. Mm-hmm. Okay? Speed is relative. Direction is definitive. Mm-hmm. See, and 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 I illustrate that to people by saying, "All right, if we both decide to go out that door over there, and one of us goes this direction, mm-hmm. immediately we know you're going in the wrong direction. It's definitive. Direction is definitive. Okay. But if I run over to the door and you take one step every 30 seconds. I'm still going to get to the door. We're still moving to the door. Mm -hmm. See, and as long as you move toward the door, you're moving toward the goal. Okay. See, and what's fast to you may not be fast to me. You know, I tell people all the time, you know what the snail said, riding on the tortoise's back, don't you? We, you know, <laughs> so speed is relative, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so speed is relative. Speed is relative. So God is interested in direction, not speed. And do you believe we have to pray? I don't believe we have to. I believe I get to. Okay. See, I have the privilege of walking into the presence of the creator of the universe and telling him, what well, is all my heart and what I'm struggling with. And, and how do you know he's listening? Because he said he would. And, okay. But how do you know? I, well. Because, like, how do you pray and know? Yeah. I mean, how do you know I'm listening? Because you're answering my questions. Well, he answers yours. Okay. The, problem, the problem is not that God doesn't answer. The problem is... Sometimes he answers with answers we don't want him to give. Much like you preaching. Yeah. Well, some like, maybe somewhat. But, you know, yes is an answer. No is an answer. Wait is an answer. Not right now is an answer. And are are those the things you feel like your intuition and your gut, those are the feelings you get? So I'll tell you a story. So uh, it's just one one event in, in our lives. But 
So this church here, Peachtree City, asked me to come here and you know be part of the staff. And so I came up, talked to them, and everything. And and on a Monday morning, it was fairly obvious that they were going to ask me to come. Okay, but Renee was a public school teacher, and we relied on her teaching in the public school system to provide our family with insurance right health insurance Mm -hmm. and so i said well maybe you need to go get a job you know maybe you need to look for a job so on monday morning we got in the car my parents house in fairber drove to calway to county we're in shorts we walk in and uh the uh lady up front says can i help you with something and Renee said, I'd like to get an application for employment. She goes, well, honey, what grades are you uh, certified in? She said, four through eight. She said, well, there's a principal back here going through resumes. Would you like to talk to him? Renee said, sure. So we. I know Renee, though. She probably was like, but I'm not dressed appropriately. Yeah, but she, so we go back. The teacher at his school had come in on Friday and said, hey, my husband got transferred. I I, I got her. I'm out. I'm out. And he said, don't worry, got to provide somebody. On Monday, we walk in. Within 45 minutes of walking in the door to pick up an application, Renee has a job. With insurance. With, With insurance, which... I had said, God, if you really want us, if you really want me here. You want me to make this move? Then provide Renee with a position. So I went oh, out. I said that. Yeah. Yeah. So I went out and got in the car, and looked up through the sunroof, and I said, Lord, I ask you to open the door and not throw me through it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because how could you say no now? Yeah. So here I here I here, said here thirty I years said, later. Thirty years later. Yeah. Wow. And what do you see in the future? Uh running hard. Yeah. How long do you want to do this? As long as I can. As long as you can. Yeah. I mean, I. I you don't get tired of every Sunday. No, I don't. Really? Yeah. I mean, you've got grandchildren. You've got a busy I, yeah, family. I got a great great life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't get old. I guess one, of, you know, one of the, no, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, Wendy, is that my kids love the church and love Jesus. You Do know? both of your daughters work in here, and your son works in here too, right? Well, they kind of. Yeah, they volunteer. All of them volunteer. One of them is on staff, right? But, but she's also a public school teacher. Okay. So she's kind of what they call bivocational. Oh, okay. In ministry. But uh, she's, man, they're, they're all great, great people. And, uh, you know, a lot of preachers' kids don't love the church. Uh, but, you know, it was, for, for me, it was never I had to do stuff. It's I, I got you to got do it. You got to do it. Yeah. And that, Back to the same old, the same old. Same old thing. It's amazing. Well, I don't, it's different, you know. It's but it's who I am. I just, you know, I love Jesus. He, I, I don't deserve what he offers, you know. And, I think uh, we all do. Isn't that what we're supposed to believe? Am I wrong? Yeah, I mean that's where you where you got to come to. That's what you got to get to. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, how how can I? I, I just shared with with somebody recently. If you just did one sin a day, and you live to the age of seventy, one sin a day, one sin a day, just one sin a day, just one one thing that you said, man, I should have done that. Okay. Okay. One. If your age of accountability is twelve, and you live to be seventy-two, that would be twenty-one thousand nine hundred sins. It's a lot. Yeah. So, so you know, 
if you had 21,900 speeding tickets, mm. would you say you're a good driver? Yeah. You know, and so people say, well, I'm a pretty good person. Well, you know, it's good. It's got nothing to do with it. See, and, 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 and how much good is good enough? Right. You know, and so that's, I don't, uh, I, I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve mercy. I don't deserve forgiveness, but he still offers it. Okay. And, and so I'm going to take it. But, okay. Well, thank you so much yeah. for your time. Oh, thank you. I love, love chatting with you about and you'll it. chat yeah. with anybody and that's what's so great yeah. about you yeah. anybody has a question I'm like yeah i kind of want to learn about this praying thing and the whole god thing and you're like anytime anytime yeah. so thank you for giving your time so graciously to Thanks me for doing this. and the yeah. second wind and i hope the sound works and uh we do too yeah but if it doesn't we we'll come back and do it again do it again right. but this was really good uh -huh. and i believe everything that you said is supposed to be said and it will affect people i hope so i do you too. know i uh, i tell you wendy and and i tell other people i love you you know and sometimes people go well you don't really know me how can you love me and this is what i ask just consider this we live in a world that says that humans can hate each other and not know each other that's true so why can't we love each other without knowing each other I agree. I agree. But I know you. <laughs> and, I, and I do love you. Yeah. I love you too. And thank you so much. And yeah, until next you. time, breathe in your second wind. Thank you for listening today. I hope that something you heard made you smile, made you think, and made you feel. If these incredible stories empowered you, awakened you, or left you feeling inspired, make sure to share with a friend and write us a review on iTunes so we can continue to change lives through this content. Make sure you tag us while you're listening on our Facebook group, My Second Wind, or hit the link in the show notes to join the conversation. Until next time, go ahead and breathe in your second wind.